Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kim Bittner, and I'm with the ESRD National Coordinating Center. Thank you for joining us today for the ESRD NCC Patient Education Quickenar. The ESRD NCC Quickenar events are held in partnership with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. We are hosting these 30-minute events weekly. They feature patient and professional subject matter experts from around the country sharing how they or their organization are coping with situations related to COVID-19. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know this call is being recorded and will be posted on the NCC COVID Quick on our webpage, usually within 72 hours. Let's take a look at the agenda for today's call. Our main speaker is Mike Spigler, Vice President of Patient Services and Kidney Disease Education from the American, Associate, American Kidney Fund. He is speaking about kidney patient financial help before, during, and after COVID-19. As our speakers go through the presentation and you have questions, please submit them using the chat feature through WebEx or the Q&A on the lower right of your screen. When we get to the uh, question and answer section of this presentation, we will share the questions we have received with our speakers. Our goal is to answer as many questions as time allows. So what is this call about? We've mentioned a little the, um, about the purpose of these, uh, that these calls are held weekly. You will hear tips about coping in a COVID-19 environment. We will share some real world experiences that you can put to use and we invite you to engage with us weekly to continue learning about a variety of topics. But, um, before we get started, we wanted to uh, quickly introduce you to the ESRD NCC Patient Grant Library. It offers information on funding sources to support ideas for education, advocacy, and or helping others living with kidney disease. It was developed in collaboration with patient subject matter experts. We are quickly sharing this with you because COVID-19 creates unique challenges for people on dialysis or living with a transplant. Some of the grants and funding opportunities might provide you or someone you know with assistance. Next slide. A quick overview of grants. Uh, there are grants and funding sources for all kinds of ideas, big and small. Some grants are awarded based on specific talents or skills, such as writing or art, while others are awarded to, provide, uh, to support ideas for providing a public service, such as kidney disease education. There are also grants available only to specific populations or communities like small businesses or startup grants for women or minorities or reasons such as COVID-19. Next slide. In addition to grant resources, the ESRD NCC Patient Grant Library has many educational resources to help you through the process. There are links that provide resources for writing proposals, creating budgets, and submitting applications. You can also get step-by-step -step instructions on how to apply for specific grants. Next slide. There's also information on how to protect yourself when searching for resources or opportunities. You'll want to be careful and alert when providing personal information. To help you, there's a section about avoiding fraud and scams. For example, reminding users to be wary of, um, about sites that promise free money for a small fee. In addition to resources, resources for reporting fraud and fraud prevention tips, there's a section about internet safety. The tutorials in this section are designed to help you better understand internet language, common privacy terms, and scams that could threaten your safety. To spread the opportunities and resources of the Patient Grant Library, we invite you to share this library with others by including a badge on your website or social media page. The instructions and code are listed on the page. Next slide. At this time, I would like to introduce Mike Spigler. Mr. Spigler has served as Vice President of Patient Services and Kidney Disease Education for the American Kidney Fund, AKF, since July 2015. He oversees a spectrum of programs and services, including prevention activities, top-rated health educational resources, and direct financial assistance that enables kidney patients to access life-saving medical care. Mr. Spigler has more than 20 years of experience in creating and managing health education programs for a multitude of chronic health conditions. 
Prior to joining AKF, Mr. Spigler served as Vice President of Education for Food Allergy Research and Education, which is a nonprofit organization in Northern Virginia. Now, this is Mr. Spigler's second time working for AKF, and he previously served as AKF's Director of Public Education from 2003 until 2008. It's um, my great pleasure to uh, welcome Mr. Spigler to the call. Thank you very much for having me. I truly appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all a little bit uh, about the American Kidney Fund. Next slide. Next slide. So most of you are familiar with the American Kidney Fund, or hopefully you are, uh, because the fund partner name and the financial assistance that we provide. And I'm going to spend the majority of my talk talking about those opportunities. But I wanted to give you a sense of, of ACAF really being a 360 degree organization fighting on all fronts for kidney patients, all the way from general awareness uh, with, the, um, with the public through advocacy. We have um, you know, uh, about 15,000 uh, ambassadors, patient ambassadors across the country in all 50 states uh, working on policy issues. Uh, in the prevention space, we have peer-to-peer -peer education programs so people go into communities and teach about kidney disease. Um, but our Know Your Kidney screening program last year screened 13,000 people in 26 cities for the risk factors for kidney disease and kidney disease. Obviously, that's been put on hold with the COVID-19 pandemic right now. It's just not something we can do is have those in-person uh, touch points with patients. Uh, but we hope to pick that up again next year uh, with our prevention activities. And then a whole wide range of public education, uh, professional education. So. Uh, for any uh, social workers, dietitians, nurses, dialysis techs on the call today, uh, we have free courses on our website as well to get those CE credits that you need. We have over 30 years of experience in doing research through a clinical scientist and nephrology program, um, which is a program that helps young uh, nephrology uh, researchers earlier in their career. And if you look at the alumni list on our website, you'll see some of the uh, leading researchers still to this day across the country at, in, at teaching institutions. Um, but the main part I wanted to talk about today, as I mentioned, is our financial assistance programs. Next slide. So our biggest program is our health insurance premium program, uh, which is otherwise known as HIP. That's how we usually refer to it internally, and most people in the world do as well. This program enables dialysis and recently transplanted patients to maintain their health insurance coverage. Um, so these are for, uh, patients that um, already have insurance in hand when they come to us, but are having difficulty paying it uh, for whatever reason they may be faced with. Um, it pays for anything that has a premium associated with it. So Medicare Part B, Medigap, um, yeah, Medicare Advantage plans are a few patients that have it now, and of course many more will starting next year. Uh, commercial plans, uh, so that includes uh, exchange plans, um, employee, employer group uh, coverage, uh, COBRA plans. We have a lot of patients um, that are on COBRA that may have been, you know, the breadwinners for their family, had the insurance for their family, crashed into dialysis, uh, and suddenly had no way to pay for their health insurance premiums for the care that they were going to need. Um, and there are even a few states across the country, which I'm sure many of you know, where Medicaid has a small premium associated with it as well, and we can help with that as well. We do not help with things like Medicare Part D or any kind of a, a drug copay programs like that. Um, these st strictly for uh, health insurance programs. And we can help patients with up to two different insurances. Um, the majority of patients that we assist, we are assisting with a Medicare Part B premium payment and a Medigap premium payment. Um, again, as I mentioned, eligibility is based on financial need. Um, it is, uh, we, we don't look at um, income, it, it is income versus expenses and liquid assets. And, and the reason we do that is uh, if we look, just looked at income alone, for a patient that crashed into dialysis, if they gave us their W-2, uh, it's going to show one salary, which has now probably gone to zero. So we look at their actual uh, income they have per month and they, now the expenses that they're faced with to determine eligibility um, and financial need. So last year alone, we helped more than 70,000 patients uh, maintain their health insurance coverage through our HIP program last year. And the thing that I, I'm most proud of, and certainly I think everyone at the American Kidney Fund is most proud of, is that, that assistance that we've provided uh, just since April of 2018. And, and that's because we had a new system go in place where we could actually start to track this. 
but we know just since April 2018, and obviously since this program's been around since 1997, it's probably tens of thousands, but just as we've been tracking it, we know that 2,600 dialysis patients were able to get transplants um, with HIP assistance. Uh, and so on, on average, we help about 100 patients get a transplant each and every month. Next slide. From a, so our second program that I want to talk about today is our safety net program. Uh, this is a small program. Admit, admittedly, it's about $100 per patient. Um, and patients are eligible to receive a grant once per year. Uh, and while that may not seem like a lot, for a patient that's faced with uh, an out-of-pocket expense they didn't expect for uh, some kind of a copay or uh, needing diabetes supplies or if their only uh, mode of transportation is their own car and they have no gas to put in it, this can mean the world for patients. Uh, in 2019 uh, alone, we helped more than 10,000 dialysis and transplant patients receive a safety net grant from AKF. Uh, and I have transplant patients listed there as well because if they have any kind of out-of-pocket cost, they can have it as well. Um, if they want to uh, you know, provide assistance to a living donor, again, it's $100, it's not a lot, but it is something. By far and away, the biggest use case for this is our transport, is transportation uh, for dialysis patients, for fuel, taxis, public transportation, uh, vehicle repair, um, followed by medication, nutritional supplements, and medical supplies. Um, but we do have patients that will also buy like durable medical supplies, um, like I mentioned, like a, a blood pressure cuff uh, or a glucometer. Next slide. Luckily, uh, we haven't had to turn this, pro this program uh, much uh, for uh, this year um, for disaster relief, although we did give out about $13,000 this year when the uh, earthquakes uh, hit in Puerto Rico. Um, I did forget to mention that our programs are for any U.S. state, any uh, U.S. territory, regardless of citizenship status. Um, so, um, because of that, we've helped all over the place. You can see, as an example, uh, Typhoon U2 we assisted with um, early last year um, in the Northern Mariana Islands, which I'm embarrassed to admit uh, did not realize was a, an American territory until uh, that happened, but we were glad to help with that as well. Um, so these are $250 grants. They are rapid response grants. So we get these out as quickly as possible. Oftentimes we will even start opening this up before a hurricane even makes landfall. What we don't want patients to do is say, I'm not going to evacuate from a hurricane because I don't have money for a motel or a hotel for a night to get away. Um, that is a big use case for what, what we've done. It's for transportation, uh, for patients that have lost everything in a hurricane or a wildfire or an earthquake. We've assisted with that as well. Um, you know, for emergency needs. And you can just see some of the, the um, things we've helped with here. Uh, next slide. But nothing has prepared us for what we have seen this year. And while not a natural disaster, this has certainly been, this pandemic has been a, a disastrous event for patients, as I'm sure all of you out there know. Um, right as this was beginning to explode in early March, in about a week's time, we put together this coronavirus emergency fund. Um, we had initially seeded this program with about $300,000 of core AKF funds that we otherwise were going to use uh, for things like um, uh, transport, um, travel to conferences, our screening program, which we had unfortunately had to suspend for the year after February, um, and seeded that money there. Usually, when we open a program like the coronavirus emergency fund up, um, that $300,000 would have lasted likely several months, maybe through the course of the entire event. When we opened this program on day one, we were getting applications in at 25, every, once every 25 seconds. Um, and by 3.30 p.m. on day one, uh, we were out of money. Uh, by the time we opened our doors the next day, uh, we were in a giant deficit. Uh, I'm honored to work with a really, really great fundraising and development team. We worked with foundations, corporate sponsors, um, individual donors uh, to meet the need of this. Um, and as of right now, actually, just since I even submitted these slides, we are now at $2.7 million, uh, approaching about uh, 11,000 patients assisted uh, with this fund. It's a $250 grant. 
uh, for financial and needy, needy dialysis or recently transplanted patients. And while that may not sound like it's a lot of money, I'll give you an example of a dialysis patient that we worked with. Um, they uh, did not, they were a dishwasher. They were laid off from their job at a restaurant. The only money they had available to them uh, was to um, rent a couch in an apartment, not even a full room for $250 a month. They were worried about being evicted because they didn't have a job. The first, they finally got another job offered to them at a fast food restaurant. The day before the person was supposed to start working there, they were diagnosed as being COVID positive. Went to their social worker and said, I have to go to work. I'm just gonna risk it because I can't be evicted. Uh, and luckily we were able to step in with our grant and assist with that, that person because otherwise they're gonna put themselves and everything or everyone around them at risk. That $250 for people that have nothing means the world for them. And we're very happy to offer that. Um, you can see it's going towards mostly necessities. 63% uh, of the people we've helped thus far just for put food on their table, as many food banks are overrun um, or empty on shelves or no volunteers to run them. So this has been a huge piece for them, uh, followed in second place by transportation, which was a major issue uh, at the height of this as public transportation routes started to go away. Uh, all of these programs um, can be uh, found uh, and the applications can be submitted on our website, which is GMS, which stands for Grants Management System, but gms.kidneyfund.org. Next slide. Here's a picture of that. So anyone can register for this. A patient can do it themselves. They can have a caregiver uh, do it for them. Um, the biggest use case by far are uh, healthcare professionals assisting with them, usually either a dialysis social worker or a transplant social worker that are assisting with patients. Anyone can register. You fill out some, some simple questions about your finances, your insurance. Um, the system will automatically deem whether or not you're eligible for the program uh, or not, and then show it to you or not show it to you, depending on your eligibility. Next slide. Well, that's it. I'm happy to take uh, any questions that anyone uh, has. Hi, Mike. Thank you so much. This is uh, Matt McDonough. I've been uh, tracking the questions as they come in, um, and we have received uh, a handful of questions. Uh, obviously, this is a very important topic, uh, and, and again, we thank you for being here to talk about it. Uh, let me start with the uh, first one that we've received. Uh, this is from uh, Kenneth, and, and just asked, you covered it in your last slide, the grants management system, how to get access to it. Um, is there a telephone number for uh, AKF if they have any technical difficulties with the with the site if they're trying to do that. Sure. Uh, actually, let me just pull that up because I don't know it off the top of my head. It's an 800 number. Uh, but if you have any issues getting into the site, I can give you the email address for uh, the grants management system, uh, which is registration at kidneyfund.org. And let me give you a phone number to contact us as well. Uh, and I will say we have transitioned fully as most of the world has uh, to working um, at home. So uh, we've got a full system of, of people answering the phones. You can also schedule an appointment with us. Um, if you call the number and after hours, it'll actually say that. Um, but uh, you can actually uh, get assistance there as well. Um, but our uh, phone number uh, for that is 866-300-2900. Uh, um, and you should uh, get through a system there um, that will get you to the right place and you can answer questions, uh, have your questions answered, or as I said, you could obviously set up an appointment. Um, you can set up a 30 minute appointment where we'll call you as well. Excellent, excellent. And for those of you who are on the line, um, I did just type that email address into the chat window as well as the phone number. Um, so um, you should have those. Make sure you take a pen and paper, jot those down. Uh, obviously, there's some interest in that. Um, as far as Kim's telephone number, at the end of this presentation, we do have a telephone number for the ESRD NCC, uh, and through that number, which you'll see on our last slide, um, you'll be able to get in touch with Kim and anyone else on our team. Um, so our next question, uh, this one's come in twice, so uh, I'll just ask one of them. Um, the website for financial assistance stated that AKF was not currently accepted ap accepting applications, and they wanted to know if that status has changed. So the only pro there, so I mentioned uh, the four different programs: uh, HIP, coronavirus, uh, disaster relief, and safety net. So obviously, disaster relief's not on because we're not 
fortunately, at least not yet, in the midst of a natural disaster. Mm -hmm. Safety net, unfortunately, uh, it, because we have moved much of the funds from safety net over to the coronavirus emergency fund, um, we, we have paused, and I hope it's just paused, the safety net grant. But the health insurance premium program, coronavirus emergency fund are both active uh, and open. Um, the uh, coronavirus emergency fund is running a deficit, but as money comes in, we pump them out. So we're doing, you know, uh, we were very fortunate that uh, AstraZeneca had given us a $1.1 million uh, grant. Um, and we were, at, we were about, you know, 2,500, 3,000 grants behind, and we pushed them all out uh, at once. Um, but as soon as they cleared out that waiting list and people saw that the waiting list was gone, we were hit again. Um, so as money comes in, we process applications. Um, I, I hope I can fairly say this, that anything that's in right now uh, or in the near future for the coronavirus emergency fund, I do believe will be paid. Um, but it's just a matter as the funds come in, they come out. Um, that, that makes total sense. And that was actually our next question. We just received another question asking about how long the waiting period is. Um, and obviously, we don't know exactly how long it is, but right. for a patient who's referred to safety net COVID-19 fund today, that was the question about how long the waiting list would be. Or the yeah, I, I think as of right now, we, are, we, we have some other asks out to some other uh, sponsors uh, or donors. Uh, if that comes through, then it could be a day, uh, but it's probably more likely several weeks at this point right. um, and, until those other funds come in. But again, for turn, turnaround time for the health insurance premium program, however, um, uh, th this is actually a quiet time of year for us because usually we get them uh, during open enrollment periods or shortly in January as people have just gone through open enrollment. Uh, so the summer is actually pretty quick for us. Our turnaround time right now on that program is about a day and a half. So wow. really quick on that right now. Uh, that's really fast. That's very quick. Um, Kim, Kim, I think this question is for you. Um, um, it may not be. And Kim, if I'm, if I'm asking it of you and it should be for Mike, let me know. Uh, the question came in, uh, has there been an increase in grant assistance requests since COVID-19? And I'm not sure if that's a question for the patient grant library that Kim covered or for Mike. So Kim, I'll let you feel that first and then punt if you need to. Thanks, Matt. Um, the patient grant library, we do not keep track of um, how many requests um, are funneled through the grants or through the, you know, the application process. Right. However, we have seen an increase in um, desire for um, uh, different grants. And so the NCC is always out, is always searching for different grants and um, opportunities to add to the patient grant library. So while I can't specifically tell you if there's been an increase in what's available, um, I can tell you there is an increase in demand, which we can, um, we can, we all understand why. But I think Absolutely. Mike might be able to answer a little bit more of how it might have been affecting AKF. Sure. So, so, I mean, as I mentioned, we, the, the first day we opened the the uh, emergency fund, um, you know, we were 25, every every 25 seconds we were getting a grant application in. So, yes, absolutely. Uh, we've seen an increase. Um, we haven't, we haven't seen, we've seen a small increase in the health insurance premium program this year. Um, not a massive one. Um, but we're also trying to do some, some research right now to look at what kinds of grants we're paying because I have the hypothesis uh, that we're likely probably paying a lot of people you know, either, either going into Medicare, right, that may have had private insurance and now decided I'm going to go to Medicare or had an employee group health plan and were laid off and are now dealing with, with COBRA. Um, so it, it is certainly, you know, a, a new world for all of us right now. Sure, sure, and, and it makes sense. We're we're charting uncharted territory here. A um, couple questions came in. Uh, one, one, does does the grant request have to be processed by a social worker, or can can a patient do it on their own? A patient can do it on their own. We do require one time when a patient first comes in for a renal professional. It doesn't have to even be a social worker. It could be your nephrologist. It could be anyone to just confirm that you actually do have kidney failure or have gotten a transplant. 
Um, once we have that in the system, then a person can do it on their own in perpetuity. Okay. And I, and I Matt, answer, can, yes, go ahead. Can I add to that? Um, through the patient grant library, um, obviously there are some grants on there too that need assistance or support uh. from a social worker, but there are some on there as well that um, patients can search and, um, you know, apply on their own as well. So there's that opportunity too. Great, thank you, Kim. Um, another question came in, um, and I think this is just asking for a clarification. For any of the grants that are offered by AKF, and I know some are on pause right now, um, are they, can you clarify if they're just once per patient per lifetime or which ones can be recurring, if any? Sure, so for disaster relief and the coronavirus fund, um, uh, it's, it's a one-time payment. Uh, for the safety net grant, it's once per year. Again, I know it's not open at the moment, um, but we hope to get it open here if we can get caught up to the coronavirus fund. For the health insurance premium program, it is in perpetuity. So, you know, we will pay for a dialysis patient's uh, assistance um, as, as long as they're on dialysis and even after they're transplanted um, a year after the, their transplant uh, as well. Um, so it, those are usually paid in quarterly payments. We can do monthly as well. It really depends on what your insurance company will accept. Um, but there's no real limit for that. And again, for the health insurance premium program, we can actually help with two different types of insurance. Again, most commonly that's Medicare Part B and Medigap. Great, thank you for that clarification. Um, this is an interesting question. Um, if somebody applies for funding, um, do you notify them if they don't receive funding or do you do only notify those who do receive funding? So, again, so there's two pieces involved with whether or not we are funding a grant application. Mm -hmm. One uh, is, are you financially eligible or not? And again, this, that is completely automated by our system. So if you're not financially eligible, you won't even see the application button there, right? You won't even be able to apply for it. Um, the other piece of it is honestly mostly red tape pieces. It's a consent form that we have to have uh, signed. It's a, you know, did you attach the bill so we know how much to actually pay the grant for? Uh, is it the right bill that was, was sent? Those kinds of things. Those are really the only reasons why we would, would den deny or and deny is not even the right word. We usually would just send it back for rework to get the last pieces. And yes, you would be notified of that. Um, and you can track the status of all those things. I think there's about 12 different statuses you can see to really kind of, you know, pinpoint where your grant is in the process uh, in the grants management system. Great. Great. Thank you. That, that clarifies that a lot. Um, you noted that a patient didn't need a social worker um, to, to sign off on the grant per se. Um, with the application process online, is it, is it such that it's would it be good to have somebody help them with the application? Um, I, I think there's just more of a concern of um, is, it, is it technically difficult to complete or medically difficult to complete? Um, um, if you're not familiar with the internet whatsoever or online systems, I think like anything, even probably logging onto a webinar like this might, you know, might be a little Um, but I feel um, to try to test it. In fact, just about a month ago, uh, we did focus groups um, with people around our organization that have, have nothing to do with my department, right? So they have never seen an application or anything, all walks of life, uh, and test them through mm -hmm. this. So we, we take that and we kind of fix the language on that. For people that are really struggling with this, it is all online. You can have a caregiver do it. So, you know, if you have an adult child that can help you with it or, or someone else, um, they can also log on and do anything that you can as a patient as well uh, to, to assist with that. Great. Great. That's good to know. Um, and I, I think this will be our last question because we are rolling up on our, our 530 time. Uh, you had gone through a list of some of the things that these grants could be uh, used for. Um, this person asks, are there any grants available um, for young adults uh, to use for things like college expenses or is it for treatment and premiums and durable supplies only. Yeah, it is It is treatment only. Uh, I will say we do have a scholarship program um, thanks to a, a grant. It's only in three states, so I'm going to cross my fingers that this person's in one of these three states, but if they happen to live in Arkansas, Oklahoma, or Louisiana, 
mm -hmm. uh, the former ESRD Network 13. Um, we do uh, have a Carolyn Wilson Scholarship Program, which I actually believe is still open right now. You can find information on the website uh, for there. Um, uh, we're certainly open for opportunities if, if we have other funding there to do that, but right now that's the only one. Wonderful. Uh, thank and, you for that, Mike. Oh, go ahead, Kim. And Matt, really quick, uh, Patient Grant Library does have a scholarship section within it, um, and the Carolyn Wilson uh, Scholarship Program is one that we happen to list in there, and then there's a, a, a great variety of others as well. So I'll just take a little time to kind of go through to see which ones uh, fit your needs. Wonderful. Uh, Mike, thank you so much for being with us tonight. I can tell you right now in the chat, um, comments saying that these grants are so helpful and they appreciate your time and this information. Some didn't know this existed. Um, so uh, on behalf of our attendees and on uh, for us as well, uh, thank you so much for being with us tonight. We really appreciate what you've shared with us. Glad to be here. Wonderful. Um, we're going to go ahead and roll into our wrap-up. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the kidneyhub.org, and, and I want to kind of tack on to what Kim had just said, uh, the patient grant library. Um, if, if you visit the kidneyhub.org, and you can do this from, uh, if you're in a treatment chair, if you're at home, you're watching TV, right from your mobile device, um, it has links to resources such as the patient grant library, um, informational videos, transplant resources, et cetera. Um, so it's something if you think oh, maybe this exists, uh, check out the kidneyhub.org. Uh, it is a, a wonderful mobile friendly tool that has a lot of these things that you may be looking for. So we invite you to visit that site on your mobile device uh, and take a look today and see what is out there for you. Um, our next COVID quick and our events tomorrow night, we have our provider focused event. It is at 5 p.m. Eastern and that is Wednesday, June 24th again. Um, our patient-focused event will be one week from today, uh, and that is at 5 p.m. Eastern. And, and then that's actually up on our uh, kidneycovidinfocenter.com website right now. And, and I think there's going to be a lot of interest in that one. Uh, and Kim, if I say this wrong, please correct me, but we'll be hearing from a patient who has gone through COVID-19 uh, and is sharing their experiences on what it was like for them to have the disease. Um, so we hope that you'll join us for that event, again, June 30th, 5 p.m. Eastern time. Um, so on behalf of the NCC, I just want to say thank you for those who asked for our phone number. Uh, you see it on the screen here. Uh, again, you can get it if you go to www.esrdncc.org. Uh, this recording and this slide deck will be up online uh, within 48 hours. Um, so please uh, pay a visit to us out on that kidneycovidinfocenter.com. Take a look at the recording if you'd like to and download the slide deck. Uh, we want to thank you again for your time this evening. And uh, as always, we hope we'll see you on a future quick hour event. Have a wonderful night.